Guru Nation, welcome back to another episode of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. I think not only for YouTube, this is going to go, this is going to be maybe a little bit longer. So it's probably going to go on the podcast too. But it's basically somebody who's asking me a question from LinkedIn. Lots of questions. Uh, looks like they're more or less a sponsor embarking on their first study. Uh, or a group of studies, and they message me on LinkedIn. Anybody can do that. And you can message me anywhere too. 949-415-656. Great text messaging uh, opportunity for you guys. LinkedIn, Instagram, working on a TikTok, uh, going to get a help with TikTok to have a TikTok person to have a full-on TikTok presence. Wherever you want, guys, let me know. It really means a lot to me that you're watching it helps me out so much when you comment and like and share and just the fact that you're watching. So thank you so much. It's, I really do appreciate it. I got asked a list of questions. I'm going to go through them. So they have to do with feasibility, more or less feasibility surveys from a site and sponsor perspective and probably good for CROs too. So who is responsible for creating the feasibility questionnaire? Ultimately, it's the sponsor, right? Even if the sponsors typically outsource this service to a CRO, the sponsor should be hands-on in designing the survey. Why? Because the sponsor should know better than any CRO, at least initially before the study even starts, what they want from sites and what kind of sites they want in the study. So sponsors typically design the feasibility surveys uh, because sponsors are the ones who wrote the protocol. So sponsors should understand or at least have some idea of where there might be issues with the protocol, specifically when it comes to an enrollment perspective. And these questions should be highlighted in the feasibility survey so that you can filter out which sites think they're good at recruiting and retaining patients for the various indication and which sites think they're still good after the limitations of the protocol. Every study has limitations. Every study seems easy at the beginning when you're just looking at the indication. For example, psoriasis, right? You tell a site, hey, we have a psoriasis study, mild to moderate, moderate to severe, whatever it may be. On the surface, Every site who sees psoriasis patients can say, okay, that's, we can do this. But every protocol has nuances. Every protocol has inclusion exclusion criteria. Every protocol has elements that the FDA really wants to look at. Every protocol, every drug, every investigational product, every biologic, every device has some kind of issues, uh, adverse events of special interest. It's a lot of nuances, right? So when the devil's in the details. So yes, the CRO typically is responsible for helping the sponsors and maybe distributing the feasibility survey, but the sponsor should create the feasibility survey. The next question is at what point of time in the clinical trial is the questionnaire created? Well, the questionnaire is obviously created before the study starts, before you even select the sites. The questionnaire should be created when the protocol is being created and definitely should be finalized when the protocol is finalized, at least the first version of the protocol. You have enough to have a feasibility survey, even a synopsis. If you have a protocol synopsis, you can design a feasibility survey. Most sites don't receive the entire protocol to do the feasibility questionnaire. They sign a CDA and usually receive a synopsis of the protocol. So that's the stage uh, point of time in the clinical trial when the questionnaire is created. Next question, what is important for the site before they decide to fill out a feasibility questionnaire? I just filled one out. So I own a site right now. I own a few, but I own one that I manage, like actively manage. It's called Yuma Clinical Trials. It's a brand new clinic out here in Yuma, Arizona. I just filled out a survey for one of my PIs, literally half an hour ago before doing this video. And I did it with these questions in mind. So the thing that the first, the main thing I look at, which is related to your first question, is the indication. Do I have patients 
do I do my PIs, my investigators, includes sub eyes, includes clinicians. Do we have patients at the high level, top level of the funnel for this indication? If the answer is no, I probably don't do the survey. Why would I do it? Maybe there's a central ad campaign that the sponsor is going to do. So th there's still times where you would do the survey just to see what support and resources the sponsor will offer. I had one study um, a few months ago. I did the survey for it. We had very few patients. It was a rare disease. We had very few patients, but sponsors didn't even really care. They only expected one to two patients per study. They only expected the sites, each site to enroll about one to two patients. So I did the survey knowing because the sponsor told us in the email that there is a central ad campaign. So the sponsor will provide resources such as advertising and support material to help the sites recruit patients. So in some cases, even if you don't have the patients, if you know the sponsor is going to offer support in the form of a central ad campaign or recruitment support of some kind, or if it's just a rare disease, you go ahead and do the survey anyways. The immediate next thing I look at is the ease of the study. So there, my site right now, we can't do overnight stays. So if I see that a visit requires, and that actually came up in the survey, one of the questions was, can you do one overnight visit? The answer was no, we can't. Uh, we don't have those capabilities at either one of my sites. I have two sites here in Yuma with two different PIs. Neither one of them have overnight capabilities. But I know there's always, if it's just a one night thing, there's always things you can do. So I checked no on the survey, but the sponsors typically come back to you and say, well, what if we can find a nursing home or a hotel just for the night with the staff. So sometimes they're willing to work with you, but that's what I look at. The next thing I look at is how much of my resources is this study gonna take? Do they have a lot of PK draws? Do they have the need for using other facilities like a hospital, like an imaging center, other specialists? Because I may not have those. I may, I may have the indication of patients, but I may not have access to those specialized facilities that the study needs. So I really do look at those kind of things, those details from the protocol synopsis. Um, that's pretty much what we look at because if I know I can't do that study, I'm not gonna waste time doing the feasibility survey. Uh, number four, what is important from the point of view of the sponsor CRO? Same thing, the sponsor CRO doesn't wanna spend time and money doing a site selection visit doing startup regulatory for the site, doing contract and budget negotiations for the site, only to get the site activated, only to find out that the site doesn't enroll any patients, right? The sponsor loses money on those kind of sites. So we, the sponsors don't want those kind of sites. So you try to weed out those kind of sites by having semi-detailed questions in the feasibility surveys pertaining to the particular pain points of the study. Even if the study didn't start, if you have competent study design people on board, they're gonna know or they should know, hey, this might be a problem for sites. We need to emphasize this particular question on the survey because we don't wanna waste time. So that's the biggest thing the CROs and sponsors need to look out for is can the sites actually do those things that the protocol requires. Not just get the patients. Most, most sponsors think, okay, that's all you need to know. It's not about, not just about getting the patients, it's about implementing the protocol at the site level successfully. That doesn't mean research naive PIs can't do a good job either, right? It, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean that just only the most experienced PIs are the ones that should be given surveys. It means the site capabilities for this particular study need to be explored further in the feasibility survey. Um, the most time-wasting thing when constructing feasibility surveys, I can't answer this question. I've never created a feasibility survey. 
for a, for a sponsor, even for, I'm trying to think of for my CRO. For my CRO on the investigator initiated trials that we worked on, we didn't even have feasibility surveys. We knew the sites beforehand that we were going to use uh, because I knew the sites personally and I knew they were capable of doing the studies. So I can't help you with that one. Um, what are the challenges that sponsors face when searching for centers? Supply and demand. In a time like right now, 2022, it's end of 2021 for those watching the future, but in a 2022 world, the supply and demand is in the favor of the research sites. There are so many studies. I think 2022 is projected to be a record year for the number of studies in our industry. So you have a large supply of studies and you have a growing supply of sites, but it's not enough to fulfill the demand. So the biggest challenge right now is identifying sites that can do your study and that also want to do your study. So you probably got to go in this market, you got to go, do they want to do your study? Number one. And number two, then can they do your study? In a normal market or in a market where there's a shortage of supply of, of trials, you can be pickier. You can say, okay, well, we already know all the sites that specialize in this indication want to do it. So we don't need to worry about that. We just need to worry on the, can they do it? And you could be pickier. In a 2022 world, you can't do that. The sites that you may want for the study may not want to do it. And the sites, the key opinion leaders that you might have in mind may not have interest in doing your study right now. They're just too overwhelmed. Forget about COVID. Just they might be too overwhelmed with studies they have for this indication. Another thing is competing studies. That's a big one, especially in 2022 world. You don't necessarily want the key opinion leaders or some of the more established sites because if you want them, chances are your competitors want them for the same or similar indications. So not only are they going to be competing for patients, they're going to be competing for their resources at the site. Maybe their best coordinators are going to work on your competitor's study rather than yours. So you kind of need to look at lesser experienced sites in this kind of environment. They can do a really good job. My site, Yuma Clinical Trails, we're brand new. One of my PIs has experience. The other one, now, now he does because we've, we've gotten two studies for him. But I'm experienced. I've been doing this for 15 years full time. If you count part time, 20 years. So my investigator is relatively new. The company's new, but it doesn't mean we can't do a good job. So you got to look, you got to look between the lines, really look, especially in an environment like we're in right now. You can't just dismiss, oh, I never heard of this PI, so we don't want them, or this site's brand new, so we don't want them. That might be a good thing. They might be able to focus on your study. Um, next question. What are the challenges that you face when filling a feasibility survey as a center? The thing that I face is the biggest challenge I face. They're, they're not really that difficult to do. The biggest challenge I face is do I have the synopsis? Because sometimes, especially in this day and age, Things are so busy, they send you the survey without sending you the synopsis. So how are you going to answer the questions? So then you just have to guess because you, as a site, you still want to put your name in the hat. You still want to put your name in the hat so that when the sponsor draws sites, you're in there. But you're guessing. You're, you're making huge, broad assumptions because you didn't get the synopsis. So you can't be as detailed as you, as you can. Another thing is not hearing back from my clinicians quickly enough. A lot of these surveys, they require you to complete them quickly because understandably, a sponsor wants to get started fast. They want fast answers, but your clinicians may not be available to give you the fast answers. So you, the person filling out the survey, 
who's never, by the way, the PI, very rarely is it the PI, they have to make a lot of assumptions. Uh, so that's, that's probably the most difficult job for me that I have as a person that fills out surveys uh, for my site. What percentage of questions are repeated in every survey? I would say about half of them. They usually ask, okay, PI name, address, site name. Are they board, is the PI board certified? Are your coordinators uh, competent? Those, those kind of questions are asked in every survey. Uh, so I would say about 50% of the survey is repeated. Uh, the other 50% is about the therapeutic indication. And if it's a good sponsor making the feasibility survey or a good CRO, it's about details regarding the study. How often does the information in these questions change, like change of staff, et cetera? It depends on the type of site. You know, if the site is a big site, obviously like a university, staff changes every day. If it's a small site like mine, it doesn't change that often. And so it just depends. It depends on the type of center you have. It depends on you. I understand where, where this question is leading to because it follows the repetitive questions about the CRCs and the site staff capabilities. I still think you need to ask that in every survey because some sites may assign different coordinators. They will assign different coordinators for different studies. Uh, at the small, like the startup phase that I'm in for a site, it's me. I'm still training my coordinators. As, as they become more experienced, we're going to start putting them on the surveys. So I still think that question is appropriate for every survey. Uh, last question. What percentage of feasibility questionnaires do you receive online? And what percentage on paper? All of 100% online. I don't can't remember the last time I received a feasibility survey on paper. Um, and it's probably been seven years, maybe more, maybe longer, that I've been seeing 100% electronic surveys. So hopefully that helps answer your questions. Hopefully if you're watching, maybe you learned a thing or two about feasibility, startup specialists at CROs, maybe this is good information for you. Hopefully I help somebody out, especially the person obviously answering the question. Let me know. See, the thing about YouTube, look, no need to hire me as a consultant. I, I'm honored. I love it. I got plenty of things going on. Obviously I'll do it if the project's right for me and it fits with my capabilities and my competencies and my schedule. But sometimes you don't need to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars to a consultant. You just ask me on YouTube. I'm, I'll be able to give it to you for free. And if you still need more help, reach out. Uh, and there's plenty of other consultants out there too. So thank you, Guru Nation. Thank you so much for watching and listening. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.